Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome back to the GDR webinar series round two. We're here with Dr. Raina Yang, a Melbourne-based dentist uh, out in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. We're very fortunate today to be talking about a topic that I think is very relevant to dentists, therapists, students. It's really the backbone of general dentistry and that's really good restorative uh, and doing that to a high degree in a way that increases you know, health, function, and longevity. So I'm really excited to dive into the nitty and gritty um, when it comes to these things. Dr. Rain has put in a lot of effort in terms of the presentations, a few videos, um, and we'll cover things through from isolation uh, all the way to composites. So very interested to kind of get into this. For those interested to find out more about Dr. Raina Yang, there's a link down in the, uh, below. So Dr. Raina graduated from University of Melbourne with honors. Uh, she's gone through and kind of continued, I guess, education, I guess, what we are at GDO all about, like continuing learning, continuing growth. She's gone, gone on to complete a postgraduate diploma in aesthetic and restorative dentistry with the College of Dental Practitioners uh, based in Sydney. That's given her a great framework, but she's gone well beyond that. She's a Coist Dental Center of Excellence in Seattle, where she's completed a full mouth rehabilitation course. She's done further training in orthodontics and dentofacial orthopedics. Um, but I believe this is the topic that's you know really keen to her heart, and that's just really good dentistry and restorative. So without further ado, I, I welcome Raina. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, so I just want to check that you can see my screen there. Yeah, that's coming good. up perfectly. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending tonight's webinar, Direct Restorative Predictable Protocols for Success. Um, I'll be covering our day-to-day -day bread and butter treatment, so posterior direct composite fillings. Um, given this is something that we all do on a daily basis, I really hope you can take home some tips that will make your Monday uh, or Wednesday more predictable and overall just a lot more enjoyable. So before we get started, Alex has already introduced me, uh, but I thought I'd just um, do a little quick intro about myself. So my name is Raina. I own a practice with my husband in Surrey Hills, Melbourne called Wattle Park Dental. Um, I graduated from the University of Melbourne in 2013. And um, with a particular interest in aesthetic dentistry, I completed an orthodontic diploma with EODO. Um, and a postgraduate diploma in aesthetic and restorative dentistry with the ACDP. Um, I've also been lucky enough to attend the Koi Centre in Seattle. Uh, but above all, my biggest role is that I am a mum to my two and a half year old daughter, Isla, with another one currently on the way. So I'm very excited to be able to share this workflow with everyone tonight. Um, we'll be covering pre-operative procedures, which includes assessing morphology and appropriate isolation, um, cavity preparation, the process of matrixing, our adhesive protocol, um, a simplified bilaminar layering approach for minimal adjustment, and discussing the ideal polishing sequence and burrs. So let's get straight into it. Um, first, our pre-operative procedure. So the first thing that you want to do is assess morphology. You want to replicate what you see on adjacent teeth. So do the neighbouring teeth have steep inclines or do they have flatter occlusal surfaces? This will help you visualise the marginal ridge height and have the end in mind. We also need to make sure that we have adequate anaesthesia. So one of my biggest tips is to give a palatal injection for the tooth you are clamping. It allows you to isolate with confidence and without concern that the clamp is digging into the patient's palate. Rubber dam can be quite intimidating at the start, so the last thing you want is a patient who is complaining about discomfort and pain. Which leads us to the topic of rubber dam isolation. So if you're looking to improve the quality and predictability of your dental work, then I cannot recommend rubber dam enough. This recent 2023 Falaco et al clinical in situ study featuring Marcus Blatz, 
who, by the way, I encourage everyone to follow on Instagram if you don't already, because he has very practical tips and he presents the research in an approachable way. It was found that rubber dam isolation has a significant effect on bond strengths to enamel, independent of the adhesive system that you're using. Its application is therefore advised whenever adhesive procedures are performed. Now, the benefits of rubber dam are countless, but most importantly for me, once you've got it on, it really does just make your dentistry stress-free. So here are some tips that I have found uh, particularly helpful. I will routinely isolate from the seven to the four or the canines if I'm cutting a premolar. And this is because we generally just get better visualization and inversion of the dam. Templates that I find quite helpful is this Bill Gerges Zeldum template. Um, I normally get my nurse to punch the holes and so I do find it's really easy for them to use. And I've also found that the whole spacing is not too far apart and not too close together where you can get tearing. You can also use um, a custom patient template. Uh, this is where you have a rubber dam sheet over their model or their teeth directly and you can mark the centre of each tooth. This is definitely the most accurate, but it can be fiddly if you are doing it um, inside the mouth. Another tip would be inverting the dam with a sharp probe. Um, and you can also get your nurse to help with blowing a triplex air. The sharper the instrument, I actually find the easier it is to invert as opposed to something like a flat plastic. Um, another tip is to rock the clamp. So after you have placed um, the dam and you've placed the frame, you can still get moisture leaking through on that terminal tooth that you've clamped. The best way to seal this tooth is by rocking the clamp with rubber dam forceps side to side, as you can see in this um, video. You want to have pressure on the buckle as you release on the lingual and then pressure on the lingual as you release on the buckle. Um, and you can also use your fingers to feed the rubber dam through the clamp so as to get a better seal. Additional retraction might be needed for those tricky subgingival or equigingival margins. So floss ties is a great um, adjunct that you can use. This is how you would tie it. Um, it basically gives better isolation and more consistent gingival tissue retraction. The tie will offer improved stability and prevent the sheet from sliding over the dental floss tie from all surfaces. And then you just pull the two strings so that it gets tighter and tighter. Um, in this video here, I've done it for anterior teeth, but you can definitely apply the same concept for posteriors. So you loop the floss tie around the tooth and use a flat plastic on the lingual surface and push deep into the sulcus. Then your nurse takes over holding the flat plastic while you pull the two ends and this will stop the floss tie from riding up. Um, I also like to floss each of the contacts, um, which you can see in this uh, video now. Um, and that's just to make it extra tight uh, so that you get that really, really firm grasp of that floss. And I'll also cut the floss tie as close to the knot as possible. Um, you'll later see after we've cut um, the floss tie in this video. So you want it super close. Um, you can see as I bring it up that it really does just help to retract that rubber dam right into the, to the sulcus compared to the other teeth that haven't had that floss tie. Now, extra retraction by tying that floss tie to the rubber dam frame can be helpful as well. This just makes it more taut and with more force. Um, and for those, oh, sorry, uh, skip that one, but basically the B4 Brinkers clamps or the Butterfly W9 clamps um, are great for those buckle subgingival scenarios. All right, cavity preparation. 
So once we've adequately isolated, we need to prepare the cavity. Based on this article by Pumans, Politano and Van Meerbeck in 2020, we need to follow a four step protocol. So the first, uh, we need to make access to the carious lesion. Uh, we need to remove carious dentine. We then need to evaluate and remove undermined enamel and we need to finish the cavity. So let's get into these steps a little bit more. So our first step, how do we access it? We're going to use a diamond burr and then we're going to clean it with a round multi-blade tungsten carbide burr used at dry low speed, usually around 7,000 RPM and this will help expose the carious lesion. Second step, uh, removal of carious dentine. Let's talk about the use of caries detector dye to help us visualize how much caries dentine we should be removing, particularly in those deep lesions. So this review paper by Alleman and Marnier in 2012 discussed combining caries detecting dye with anatomical and histologic knowledge to arrive at an ideal caries endpoint for restorations. It's stated that the main objective is to create a peripheral seal zone and the absolute avoidance of pulpal exposure while generating a highly bonded restoration with excellent long-term prognosis. For those small shallow lesions, removal of caries by traditional visual and tactile techniques has been very successful. Um, however, for our more medium to deep lesions, we do need more sophisticated techniques to determine that endpoint. Alleman and Marnier stated that by creating a peripheral seal zone one to three millimetres wide, consisting of normal superficial dentine, DEJ and enamel, a bond strength of approximately 45 to 55 MPa can be generated. This peripheral seal zone will be confirmed by the total absence of caries detecting dye staining. In other words, there should be no pink stain left in this region. By leaving the slightly infected and partially demineralized but highly bondable affected inner caries dentine inside this peripheral zone, a bondability of 30 MPMA can actually still be obtained in these deeper areas. So this can be confirmed by light pink staining from caries detecting dye, which you can see in this image. The caries should be removed in a centripetal approach. So in other words, from the periphery to the critical points in the center. And this approach does help with avoiding that pulpal exposure. So our third step, um, evaluating and removal of undermined enamel. If the remaining cusp has a thickness of two millimeters or more, the enamel is supported by and the enamel is supported by dentine, then that cusp should be kept. Undermined cusp should be reduced by at least 1.5 millimeters and capped. The more the height of the cusp is reduced, the less dentinal support is needed. With a strongly reduced lever arm as well, that risk of flexure of the cavity wall is also reduced. And lastly, our fourth step. So our sharp internal angles should be rounded. Um, this is because composites adapt better to rounded cavities rather than those, that sharp internal architecture. And it can also have a cusp weakening effect. We also need to finish our enamel margins. So to do this, um, the sharp unsupported enamel prisms of the occlusal and proximal buccal and lingual cavity margins should be removed with a flame-shaped diamond burr. Um, the sharp and irregular enamel prisms at the cervical margin can be removed with a di metal diamond strip as seen in this image. Um, Well-finished margins will result in good adaptation of the resin composite with a really nice tight marginal seal. Now the question, to bevel or not to bevel? So the advantages of beveling is that you do get a high enamel bond strength as we're opening up the orientation of the enamel rods and thus are more likely to bond to them in a longitudinal fashion rather than perpendicular. The bevel will improve to shade match as well. It will have a blending effect and this um, helps avoid those white lines. 
But the disadvantages are that composite is too thin at this region of the enamel bevel, which does make it a bit more prone to chipping, cracking of the enamel at these margins. It's also said that the bevel will unnecessarily remove tooth structure. So the recommendation would be to remove the sharp unsupported enamel prisms of the caver surface margins, which you can see here highlighted in red, with a flame-shaped diamond burr. These margins should just be carefully smoothed and finished. So on to matrixing. We mentioned um, a centripetal approach for our caries removal. This outside in approach should also be applied to our restorative layering. In other words, we want to convert all our cavities to a class one cavity, thereby simplifying these scenarios. When deciding which matrix system, the most ideal is using sectional matrices as they will provide a convex profile with a tight contact. Um, so here are some tips that I have for matrixing. Uh, consider pre-wedging. So why do we do it? Uh, it's often if the matrix can't be placed easily, it also helps to protect the rubber dam and the adjacent tooth from damage. Uh, it will help start the separation process from the beginning for easier matrix placement. And it also just helps to retract the soft tissue and the rubber dam. Um, what do we use? We can try using wide and rigid wedges. I find the wooden wedges are especially rigid. And the best way is actually to insert them with a curved mosquito hemostat so you can apply the strongest pressure and insert them completely. By waiting a short interval of time, there will be enough separation. Um, if the interference is also located near the occlusal surface where you can't fit the matrix, you can also use a flat plastic instrument with hand force to separate the teeth. Now placement of our matrix band. Um, what we wanna do is avoid deformation. The matrix must be placed without pressure. And keep in mind that these matrices are very thin. They're 0.038 millimeters. So do be aware that they easily deform. The other thing is we do not want to burnish these sectional matrices. The composite takes the shape of the matrix. So by burnishing it with something like a ball burnisher, you will cause deformation and irregularities. What you can use instead is like a cotton pellet with tweezers or a micro brush to push out the matrix slightly to ensure that con it's contacting with the adjacent tooth. Use of Teflon. So wrapping the Teflon around the wedge, like you can see in this image, creates a custom wedge of varying thickness to more effectively seal the proximal floors of the cavity and it will help adapt the matrix intimately to the contour of the tooth all around the cavity floor. Another great use of Teflon is to pack it cervically or coronally. So by doing this, it seals and adapts to the proximal wall better. Um, I usually like to pack it before you place the separation ring as I find it's easier to pack and you can visually see that the matrix is flush with the tooth. It can be quite difficult to polish in this region. Sometimes you can gouge the tooth. So by placing Teflon in this area, you can minimize the excess composite needed to be polished. Sequencing. So when doing multiple fillings, um, again, always thinking that you need to convert them to a class one first. And you can place back-to-back -back matrices, but you do not want to ring stack. So ring stacking is when you place multiple rings on, for example, one for the mesial box and one for the distal box at the same time. But this has actually been shown to diminish the effect at the contact area. So ideally, you just place all your matrices and wedges to ensure that you've sealed off the cervical floor for each of those cavities. And then you alternate the ring from one side to the other, working your way through. 
I would generally complete the DOs first without a separating ring um, because it's a lot easier to adjust the distal of a six, for example, as opposed to a mesial of a seven. You just use your soft flex disc and brush towards you. Um, then I would complete the MOs with a separating ring. So in this um, image, this scenario, I would first do the 1-6 DO where there's no need for a ring uh, because you haven't made the 7 yet, so you don't need that contact yet. Um, and then you use the soft flex and brush towards you for any interproximal adjustment. Then I would remove the 1-6 DO matrix band and I'd move on to the 1-5 DO. Again, no need for the ring, using a soft flex if I need to make those adjustments. Um, and then after that, I would go on to my MOs. So 1-7 MO, now placing a separating ring on, finish that one, convert to a class one cavity, then move on to the 1-6, moving that separating ring from the seven to the six. And then the last one I'd do is the 1-5. So in this image here, this is sort of an example of converting everything to a class one cavity and completing the proximal boxes first before completing the whole restoration. Subgingival defects. So we all know that adapting that matrix band to the base of these restorations can be very challenging. Um, crown lengthening, ortho extrusion, surgical exposure are options, but they are quite invasive and time consuming. They can also cause further attachment loss, exposures of root concavities, vacations, um, dentine hypersensitivity, unfavorable crown to root ratio, and also there can be issues with compromised aesthetics. So this is where deep margin elevation techniques can be used. What DME is, um, is it relocates the cervical margin of teeth with subgingival defects to a supragingival position. Um, this 2022 systematic review, review by Samatsi et al, again featuring Marcus Blatz, showed that it is a technique applicable for direct and indirect restorations. It was stated that DME does not affect bond strength, fatigue behaviour, fracture resistance, failure pattern or repairability, and that it is compatible with periodontal health given that they are well polished and refined. Um, in this landmark paper by Marnier and Sprifico, they basically discussed that DME technique was originally intended for those semi-direct or indirect restorations, but it also represents a useful um, preliminary tool before placing a large direct composite resin restoration. Um, in such cases, D DME can actually further facilitate the positioning of your separation ring and generate just improved contours and tight proximal contacts. So what are our options for matrix uh, matrixes? We um, have modified curved Toffelmeyer matrix or the Gerbkes band, um, a matrix within a matrix or the DME kit. So if we look at a traditional matrix, at full height, um, it has a deficient gingival seal. And this is due to the fact that there's a high contour of the clinical crown. Um, a specially designed margin elevation matrix will provide you with the best gingival adaptation and contour for the deep margin areas. And this is because the height is now trimmed down to allow improved adaptation. You can modify the normal matrix system that you have in your clinic. Um, so reduction of the matrix height to a maximum of three millimeters is what you want. You want it slightly higher than the desired elevation that you're trying to achieve. And the narrowness of the matrix will allow um, it to slide subgingival and seal the margin more efficiently. Typically no wedging is needed. So this then allows for a more curved matrix and the marginal seal is now secured. This is um, the Gerges matrix. It's a fantastic one designed by Bill Gerges um, and it can be used in a standard Toffelmeyer holder and has great curvature. So um, these images were taken, um, oh sorry, 
Let's go back. <clears throat> These images were taken directly from his Instagram, um, which is, again, a really great resource. So please go check that out. Um, you can see here that it creates even more of a divergent proximal profile um, than your modified matrix. Uh, and you need to apply side pressure with a flat plastic, as you can see in this second image, um, to increase the apical seal and get that profile divergence. We also have the option of um, a matrix within a matrix. So this technique involves sliding a sectional matrix between the margin and your existing matrix band. Flowable is then applied um, with the matrix in place. Um, and then now you can see uh, that the DME has allowed for the positioning of the separation ring better positioning, I should say. We then convert it to a class one cavity. Um, and then in this case, the adjacent tooth could be directly restored with the sectional matrix. You can see the use of Teflon here, uh, again, converting it to a class one cavity. And then we layer and polish. And this is our final restoration in the mouth. Okay, so our adhesive protocol. Um, when it comes to our adhesion, we need to consider the following. So air abrasion um, to remove biofilm, selective enamel etch, and dentine bonding challenges. What system are we going to use? So with air abrasion, um, the idea is to blast the surface to remove the biofilm and stains. And it has been reported um, that air abrasion increases the surface roughness and surface area available for adhesion and improves resin adaptation. Um, you would be using aluminium oxide, 27 to, 15, to 50 microns. And there are quite a few options. So you can do chair side sandblaster, like you can see here as a Danville micro etcher. It's the one I use. Um, or you can purchase something um, a bit more sophisticated like an Aquacare. So selective enamel etching. We all know that bonding to enamel is the most predictable. Enamel is highly crystallized, consisting of glass prisms. There's no water and no collagen. Um, on enamel, acid etching selectively dissolves the enamel rods, creating these microporosities, which are then readily penetrated um, even by ordinary hydrophobic bonding agents. Upon polarization, this micromechanical interlocking of the tiny resin tags within the acid etched enamel surface still provides the best achievable bond to dental substrate. So when you are doing your selective etch, um, you're using 30 to 40% phosphoric acid for 15 seconds. Um, the acid demineralizes the surface, creating those etch patterns. Make sure you wash for the same amount of time as you are etching to remove those salts. And provided you've properly selective etched just the enamel, you can dry as much as needed. So with dentine bonding, um, historically, especially compared to enamel bonding, it's been considered a lot more difficult and less predictable. Um, this is because of its heterogeneous nature with hydroxyapatite deposited on a mesh of collagen fibres. So think about it like a bunch of straws and the outside of the straw is made of mineral and the inside of the straw is made of collagen fibres and water. These fluid filled tubules or straws um, render the exposed dentine surface naturally moist and hydrophilic. It's ultimately this hydrophilicity that will make bonding of our hydrophobic resins so difficult. Another challenge is freshly cut dentine has a layer of debris known as the smear layer, which can inhibit effective bonding. So with so many bonding systems on the market, it can be so confusing, what should we use? Now, instead of thinking about all the different generations, I think we're up to eighth generation now, um, 
this classification isn't necessarily the best to differentiate our bonding system. Think of it as two main systems. You have your total etch, now termed etch and rinse approach, and your self-etching system. So with total etch, this is where we um, remove the whole smear layer and we are etching the dentine with phosphoric acid, the same acid that we use for enamel. So normally this looks like 15 seconds of selective enamel etch and then 15 seconds of the etch onto dentine. So you're flooding now the whole cavity at this point. In a two bottle system, um, the primer and adhesive are separated. So the primer contains hydrophilic functional monomers in a solvent, and then you've got hydrophobic resin penetrates the collagen network that is now exposed. So this resin infiltrate is subsequently polymerized to form a hybrid layer, and in conjunction with these resin tags occupying the space within these tubules, it provides micromechanical retention. The one bottle system is where the primer and the bond are combined. And it has been documented in the research that these do perform inferiorly compared to two bottle systems as they are unable to infiltrate um, the demineralized collagen network as effectively. And that results in suboptimal hybridization. They have also demonstrated more hydrolytic breakdown and poorer clinical performance. So you've probably heard with these systems, um, you know, dry, but do not desiccate. Because if you desiccate, the collagen fibres collapse, creating a poor bonding surface. But then if you don't dry enough, you'll get excessive moisture and water is then trapped, resulting in that hydrolytic breakdown. And you're going to get voids at the bonding interface known as nano leakage. So OptiBond FL um, is a two bottle system. Um, it's been widely known as a gold standard, but I think it's also important to note that the research was done on extracted teeth where pulpal fluid is eliminated, which is normally our source of moisture. Also done in a lab with dedicated specific air pressure from a certain distance. So the moisture is completely controlled. Whereas in a clinical situation, um, there's so much variability from clinician to clinician. And even within the same clinician, you're going to get that variability. So our next system is the self-etch system. Um, this is where we're avoiding etching the dentine completely. We still selectively enamel etch with phosphoric acid, um, but this is where the self-etching primer, which contains acidic monomers that etch the prime, uh, etch and prime the dentine substrate simultaneously. The main benefit of this um, approach is that it's decreased technique sensitivity in relation to the application and the dentine wetness. You don't have to worry about drying too much or not drying enough. Um, although there have been concerns about their bonding efficacy, certain self-etch systems have been shown in the research to have satisfactory clinical and laboratory performance as found in this landmark paper by Van Meerbach. Um, mild self-etch systems, it was found to demineralize, demineralize the dentine partially and that actually leaves hydroxyapatite crystals in the collagen. So the residual hydroxyapatite can chemically interact with our functional monomers and as such, mild adhesives facilitate both micromechanical and chemical adhesion. So you also have a two bottle self etch system. This is where the wet and dry chemistry are separated. So that is the self etching primer is in one bottle and the adhesive resin is in another. An example of this would be our Clearfill SE bond. Uh, one bottle systems are known as universal. So this is typically more acidic and hydrophilic than those two step adhesive. There's normally higher susceptibility to water attraction resulting in that hydrolytic breakdown that we don't want. A lot of these systems do contain HEMA, um, which has the benefit of improving wettability, but it also means that there's more water sorption at the interface. 
It remains hydrophilic after polymerization, resulting in water uptake, plasticization of the resin and subsequent hydrolytic degradation over time. The more contemporary one bottle systems have actually removed HEMA, which has been shown to improve the effect of bond bonding durability. Um, the absence of HEMA makes the adhesive more prone to the occurrence of a so-called phenomenon of phase separation. So to pre prevent this, you really need to strongly um, air blow with prolonged air pressure. Um, and this should be performed before it gets polymerized or cured so that you remove this from the adhesive layer. Um, you'll find this in the instructions for something like G-Premio Bond, an example of a universal system. So what were our conclusions from all of this? Well, as found in this um, 2011 literature review by Cadosa et al, despite the rather disappointing performance of those all-in-one self-etch adhesives, conventional three-step etch and rinse adhesive and two-step self-etch adhesives have shown satisfactory results and are still the benchmark for dental adhesion in routine uh, clinical practice. When bonding to enamel, selective enamel etching is definitely preferred, as we've discussed. And on the other hand, the mild self-etch approach seems to provide superior performance when bonding to dentine because it chemically interacts with the residual hydroxyapatite, which definitely contributes to bond durability. Thus, when bonding, um, to both enamel and dentine, selectively etch your enamel, followed by the application of something like a self-etch adhesive to both etched enamel and non-etched dentine. This might pre present as the best option to effectively and durably bond to your dental substrate. So layering and polishing. The aim is to emulate nature in a bilaminar approach, but why? So the reason is this method results in restorations um, that will provide a simplified protocol, allowing for better spatial judgment of your layers. It also means it blends seamlessly with the surrounding two structure. And for me, most importantly, it just requires a lot less polishing and occlusal adjustment, which is a massive time saver. As found in this um, fantastic clinical paper by Politano and Pumens, um, and as this diagram reflects, dentine composite should be layered in a concave way and enamel composite in a convex way. So for our dentine replacement, um, we should be using a highly filled flowable composite resin. This readily adapts to the cavity margins the cavity floor and also the overlying conventional composite layer. It also automatically assumes that concave shape of the dentine. So materials um, that I like to use are GUI, uh, Genial Universal Injectable for those medium to shallow cavities. I like it because of its radio opacity um, and also it's got this increased viscosity which makes it easier to extrude um, out of the syringe and it holds its shape really nicely. Everex Flow is a fantastic um, fiber reinforced flowable composite and is more indicated for those deep to medium cavities. Um, as a side note, I like the dentine shade uh, because there's a bulk shade and a dentine shade. Uh, I find it's just a lot more opaque, so you don't get that grayish translucent look to it. Now for our enamel replacement, um, any conventional composite can be used and we should be building up our cusps in individual steps. I personally use the GC Genial uh, Posterior as it has a similar radio opacity to GUI. Um, when layering, we want, again want to convert to a class one cavity and for the proximal box, as you can see in this image, you want to use a highly filled flowable of at least two millimeters thickness for that good marginal adaptation. And then you put the conventional composite over the top. 
So that will make it that class one cavity. Um, and then attention should be paid to when you're building up the cusps. Um, you want to make sure that your instruments are at a correct inclination so that you also have enough um, space for your opposing cusp. I like to use the flat plastic first and then the, this Didier DHE Composculp uh, one two instrument to help build up my cusps and apply the appropriate um, anatomy. So I do find that this significantly reduces the time that you need to adjust the occlusion as well as finishing and polishing. Um, to remove flash and any excess composite interproximally, I will uh, generally use a size 12 blade. I just find it a lot sharper than a scalar and it can be used to access those interproximal areas a lot easier because it is so thin. Um, and also I'll use a coarse soft flex disc. For my final polishing and finishing, I'll often use a diamond burp just for any minor occlusal adjustments if it's needed, and also just to define some of those grooves and anatomy. Um, and then the th usually three of the silicon polishes with decreasing grit size. So this just helps to remove scratches from the diamond burp. So options would be um, Jiffy from Ultradent. This is what I use, the green, yellow, white at 7,000 RPM. Um, also, I've heard the Astropol burrs are really good um, at 10,000 RPM and you'd go in order of gray, green and pink. All right, so let's apply some of what we learned tonight with a clinical scenario. So first we are applying um, our four-step protocol that we mentioned. So we need to access the carious lesion and then removal of the carious dentine with the aid of carious detected dye. We then um, also use, uh, we evaluate and remove any undermined enamel and then we finish the cavity by removing any sharp and unsupported enamel prisms and clean the cavity without air abrasion. Um, you can see the use of Teflon here applied cervically for a better uh, marginal adaptation. And um, using our bilaminar layering approach, I've applied Everex Flow in this case for our dentine replacement layer, since it was a medium sized cavity. And then we're building up the marginal ridge first. And, and as we've said multiple times tonight, we're converting it to a class one cavity. Our enamel um, replacement layer is now built up with conventional composite and a flat plastic and composcope tools are used to build up each cusp. Um, and then we just complete the layering process. Uh, also, make sure you use glycerin to apply um, to ensure full curing of our oxygen inhibition layer. And we use ex, uh, any excess flash and interproximal composite is removed with the size 12 blade. The inclines and margins um, and, and excess need to be assessed from all angles and polished with the diamond football and jiffy burrs. And then our final restoration is checked with articulating paper to see that it fits in the occlusion. And um, in this case, minimal occlusal adjustment was required. All right, so as a summary, um, the key messages that I would like you all to take home tonight uh, for pre-operative procedure, don't be discouraged if you find rubber dam difficult at the start. If you keep using it and practicing, you will get faster and better at its application and it will just make your dentistry a lot more predictable and stress-free. Cavity preparation should be used with our traditional visual and tactile techniques, but with the adjunct of caries detector dye for those deeper lesions and air abrasion to help remove plaque and biofilm. Taking the time um, for your matrixing is really important and using tools like Teflon to ensure you get a good apical seal is going to help you reduce the amount of polishing at the end. 
with your adhesive protocol, there are so many excellent bonding systems that do work well, but it's just important to be aware that some systems are more technique sensitive than others. Um, and layering with a bilaminar approach using the natural tooth as a model. So enamel and dentine are where they're meant to be to emulate nature and minimizing the amount of time for occlusal adjustments. Plus it looks nice on Instagram. So posterior direct restorations are something we all do on a regular basis. Um, when done thoughtfully and intentionally and with the right workflow, it can provide uh, a lot of satisfaction and just bring a lot of joy to your daily practice. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening in tonight. I've thoroughly enjoyed presenting on this topic. Um, and if you have any questions, please ask me. Thanks, Raina. That was a wonderful presentation, super clear in terms of your approach, uh, you know, I guess just like the restoration and the, uh, the, the protocol, your delivery was similarly uh, really clear and concise in each of those steps. We do have a few questions and I have some of my own. Um, yeah, sure. Obviously, there's a lot to restorative, but we'll go through. So Chris asks, how do you prevent clamps flinging off? And perhaps I can uh, further that question. What are the situations or what are the, I guess, the factors that often lead to clamps coming off? Coming off, yeah. So I guess they're more for those partially erupted teeth. Um, they can be really hard to find the appropriate clamp. So normally for my routine clamps, I'm using 12A for my quadrant two and four, so even numbers, and um, 13A for quadrant one and three. Um, but uh, they do have like a sawtooth edge. So sometimes that can really help with that grip and stop that flinging um, as opposed to something like an eight or nine. Um, but for those partially erupted cases, I would actually look at something like a 14 clamp. It's essentially got this curve to it and it um, grips the tooth subgingivally and it's got four points of contact. You will find that it is a little bit um, difficult to feed the dam through, but that's where you're rocking of the dam and then stabilizing it with your other hand, just to make sure that you've got that control and you feed the dam through. So that's a possible um, clamp to use. Yeah, and I think that also kind of comes to what you first said, and that was good local anesthetic. So I think sometimes the tentative placement of the clamp especially mm -hmm. if the patient starts feeling it on the palate or the lingual, you know, that, that's when we don't seat it perhaps, uh, Chris, as deep as we'd like, and then it ends up coming off. So having good anesthesia to start with gives you the confidence to seat it uh, deeper. Absolutely. And I, I did find when I was, you know, first starting off, that's the biggest thing. You're like, try not to hurt the patient. But now, honestly, I will get in there quite aggressively. Um, and for those lowers, uh, you can also do a buckle infiltration for those molars, uh, because sometimes the buckle does feel it as well. So don't be afraid to give more anesthetic. Yeah, I think for those of us, the more experience we get, the more the more we anesthetize uh, yeah. proactively. Um, so that's great. And it, touching on rubber dam, because I think that's, that is an important step. Where, where have you seen or where do you see, you know, for those who've tried it, it just, you know, they say it's not worked or ha hasn't kind of been effective. Um, how do you find kind of navigating to kind of get back into it or, or to really give it a go? And what's the right mm -hmm. expectations in terms of, um, how long it should take before it's becoming more efficient in your practice? Um, okay, so uh, I guess when people are having a bit of trouble with it, um, what makes them sort of continue with it or what little tips? Yeah, or, or not, not give up. <laughs> yeah, not give up. Um, I think, well, you know, honestly, it is just going to be a lot of practice and um, knowing that, it, it isn't easy at the start. Like there's a lot of factors that are fighting you. The saliva makes it very slippery. Um, I guess certain dams are also not the easiest to use. So I know that the purple dam does um, is quite thick. So sometimes it can be quite difficult to invert. Um, so I would say investing in 
good rubber dam sheets is going to make your life a lot easier. It's not going to rip as easily. You're not going to struggle with it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I know not everyone's a practice owner and do doesn't get that choice, but um, it could be something that um, you really push for, like out of all your priorities, that would be a big thing that I would try to push for is getting good quality rubber dam sheets. Um, and I think just, yeah, just basically using all the little tools that I would have mentioned tonight to try things out in, you know, tricky situations. So as I said, in those subgingival cases, um, using a couple of different ways, like a floss tie, or maybe having a little other extra clamp, like a Brinker's one to seat it, um, is going to help, help with that. I will say sometimes, I'm not sure what your experience is, do you sometimes, um, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember if you mentioned it with the DME, start preparations without rubber dam and then look at placing rubber dam mid preparation? Yeah, um, I would probably, like, generally I don't, generally I just put the rubber dam on so I don't have to really worry about it or think about it. Plus it just has helped with a lot of retraction of your soft tissue, like your tongue, your lips and things. Um, but for example, if the cavity itself um, means that you can't really get the dam in because if you are to sort of um, retract the hole over, it cuts the dam um, and tears it, then sometimes I'll have to open up that cavity a little bit more without rubber dam and then attempt to put the rubber dam on. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so Max here asks, uh, you mentioned that caries removal should start from the periphery. Now, my understanding, periphery, you're referring from the enamel outer layer, uh, working your way in. And then the question I think follows, how does this help prevent pulp exposure? Um, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on what you mean by periphery and how you work about working your way in. Yep, sure. So I would generally start off um, getting rid of the hard tissue, which is your enamel, um, because then you can also visualize a lot better. Um, so you're essentially removing as much as you can on the outside. Um, I guess for those deeper lesions, if you are removing inside out, that's when you have a lot less control of your burr, and that's when you can start to gouge things um, and you know, if it's a very deep cavity, it's often where you start to get a pulp exposure. So I would go enamel and your DEJ always has to be caries free. That's part of that peripheral seal zone. Um, so we need to make sure that's completely uh, caries and there's no detector dye stain there. Um, and that's why that's uh, allowing you to then see how close you are to the pulp. Yeah. And I think Max also, it, it probably depends as well whether you're uh, working from dentine cervically versus occlusally. I, I think kind of essentially working your way in and, and thinking about where you are from the DJ. Uh, Danica, are you concerned? This is probably a question that comes up quite a lot. Are you concerned about the use of flowable at the bottom of a class two due to its polymerization contraction resulting in a marginal gap? Um, no, I'm generally not because ge if you're going to be using paste composite, it's actually a lot harder to achieve that marginal seal. Whereas something like flowable, again, choosing a flowable that holds its shape um, and that really, if you can even manipulate it with a perio probe to make sure that you've gotten to all the areas that you want it to seal off um, before curing. So I generally find that it's going to help a lot more in getting that marginal adaptation compared to a paste composite. And this is something that I would, uh, I, I would check with x-rays as well. So when I first started out, um, I was, you know, doing it a certain way, taking a bite wing afterwards and finding I could actually see if there were any deficiencies. Um, and I found that with flowable, you definitely get a lot better of that adaptation. And I think what's really important is make sure your flowable is very radio opaque. Um, I'm sure we've all been there. Um, 
it is a great technique and as you said adaptation but if your floorboard is slightly radio loosened or not very radio opaque yes. uh, you know your end restoration can sometimes look uh, be below ideal uh, radiographically Absolutely, especially for DME, um, like we, we didn't talk about indirects tonight, but yes. when you are doing an onlay but you've done DME beforehand, you really need to be taking a bite wing before you go and insert that onlay for that same reason. Uh, yeah, and I was going to say, and I'm not sure what your experience has been with heated composites. Sometimes I guess that's the the marry of the two in terms of flow and packable. Um, have you do you use much of heated or have you used heated? Yeah, I have used heated um, more in those indirect restorations. So again, with onlays, um, we'll heat up the composite. So instead of uh, applying that with gooey, um, I would go with a heated composite sometimes. And that's just a lot easier the clean up I found because it almost gets to this gel phase that's very tacky and then you can remove it with a scaler quite easily. Yeah. Um, excellent. And then one next question was, if you're going to polish the restoration, um, don't you remove the oxygen inhibited layer? Yeah. So um, this is, yeah, often a question. Depends how good you restore, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, look, you, in the end, you are removing some of that um, oxygen inhibition layer, but you don't know like how much of it you are. It's it's quite unpredictable. Um, and also apparently it does get into your burrs, um, that uncured resin. So mm -hmm. I would always use a glycerin barrier. If you've gone all your way to make sure your bonding protocol is good, you're layering, you're doing a bilaminate approach, it's a very simple last step to just apply the glycerin to know that you've fully covered um, and you've cured the whole thing. And I think to answer the question, the most critical aspect for, you know, our composite restorations is not the occlusal surface where your burr may be adjusting, uh, but it, it's actually more the subgingival or equigingival, you know, gingival floor uh, aspect, and then the, I guess, the margins that adapt buckly and lingually. So those are the areas perhaps we're not polishing. Perhaps the adaptation of, you know, your bands was fantastic, um, yeah. and that's where we want, you know the best cure and the best bond because that's where we see the breakdown. Exactly. Uh, Max continues. So and this is a this is quite a challenging question. So when we're looking at deep marginal or sub deep margin elevation or subgingival marginal elevation, uh, what rubber damp clamp would you use? Um, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on your clamp sequence. So let's say a upper six or lower six mesial distal deep margin perhaps versus a uh, second molar, perhaps as the most difficult kind of scenario, what would be uh, your approach to clamping those scenarios? Okay, so DME on the terminal tooth or? Um, his question was initially, let's say the three, six distal, assuming there's a three, seven. Assuming and then we can ask a terminal tooth as well. Okay, so the subgingival margins on the three, six. Yeah. Great. Um, well, in my, in my hands, I have found that the 13A, as I said, for that terminal tooth in your quadrant three works quite well. Um, and again, having that, making sure that you really do push the clamp all the way down into the um, such subgingival area for the seven first, so that you're making sure that you're already at the level that you want to be at. And then with your um, three six, you would um, essentially be using the the technique of that matrix within a matrix or that Gerges band modified Toffelmeyer. Um, if you're doing DME on a terminal two, so the one that you've clamped, um, it can be a lot trickier. Um, so if we're doing, say, an MO, you need to make sure, I guess, the holes are a little bit closer together because you don't want too much rubber dam in between, which could uh, impact on your matrix placement because there is a bit of bounce back of that rubber dam onto the matrix. Um, if we're doing, say, a DO on um, 
the last tooth that you've clamped. Uh, I would generally be uh, using, because you don't have to worry about a contact, I would generally be using a modified Toffelmeyer or that Gerges band because um, it will hug the tooth a lot better and it will often get that marginal adaptation because of its divergence. Wonderful. Um, by the way, everyone, I just want to say thank you. We had about 200 people joining us tonight. The questions seem to be keep coming, so I'll, I'll probably have to speed up a little bit. Um, we seem to be yeah. coming quicker than we are answering. Um, then uh, we've got Isabella. Thank you for your question. Hi, Rena. Can you please explain again the sequence you follow when you have multiple adjacent MO and DO restorations? So perhaps touching on that. Yep, so um, that sequencing is basically where we need to convert um, to our class one cavity. So we're just doing the mesial walls and the distal walls. Um, so essentially you are um, putting all your matrix bands in place with the wedges. And you need to make sure that all the floors are looking sealed. There's no gap formation because this is going to make your ring placement a lot smoother and faster and you have confidence that you've really done that step. So I guess, you know, we're, we're trying to be as efficient as possible as well. Um, so then once you've got all your bands and wedges in place, um, I would generally do the DOs. So if you think about it, if you've got a 1.6 DO and a 1.7 MO, the 1.7 MO with your soft flex disc, if you need to make any, you know, interproximal adjustments, I normally do this without water, um, it's going to be, you're going to be doing it to the back of the patient's mouth. Whereas when you're doing a 1.6 DO, you're going to be moving forwards. You're going to be brushing towards you. So that's why I generally do the 1.6 DO um, first. Um, and I don't need to use a ring there because um, we're not focused on the contact just yet. We're just creating that nice contour. And then later on, when I come back to do the MOs, I now put a separating ring between the 6 and the 7. Um, to make sure I've got that tight contact and, and build up the ammo. So once I've done all my walls, I'm just left with simple occlusals where I don't have to worry at all about matrixing. I can take everything out. Um, sometimes I'll leave wedges in just to make sure there's no bleeding. But uh, in terms of the matrix and the Teflon, they're all now removed. Yeah, and that DO um, and, and polishing is great. It's the first time I've heard of that tip. Sounds um, now, me can ask for shallow restorations um, only in enamel, uh, e.g. chips. Now, I'm guessing anterior chips. I know the discussion was on posterior today. The question yeah. is, would you etch and rinse and bond, I'm guessing, and then place a resin restoration with no other steps? Um, yep. So I'm thinking if it's like a really small class for cavity, um, yep, I would just uh, error braid, always um, generally error braid, and then I would do my selective enamel etch, but dentine is probably not even exposed in this case. Uh, I would apply the bond, prime and bond, and then after that, the composite on top. Okay, wonderful. Now, next question is, and this is an issue, how many increments or in what increments do, are you restoring or cusp capping? Um, in terms of, I guess, the, so after the, the cusp builder? Yes, let's, let's assume the cusp builder. Oh, I think I understand. So, um, if they're talking about cusp, uh, cusp capping, say a mesial buckle cusp, yeah. um, I'm always just basically trying to uh, convert it to a class one. So if the matrix doesn't, you know, adapt or hug the tooth very well because I don't have enough buckle tooth structure. I will actually build up a little bit of the buckle first, but mm -hmm. I won't extend it to the proximal box mm -hmm. all the way, just so that now my matrix has support on both the buckle and the palatal. And then this now becomes a class two cavity. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of going from you know, a, uh, a tooth that doesn't have much tooth structure to a class two cavity, and then you'd make the class two into a class one. And so just to clarify there, so 
let's assume we've got a four mil reduction in the cusp height. You're doing a two mil increment first, then placing your band and then finishing off that mesial buckle before doing the interproximal. Okay. Um, or are you doing the interproximal and then finishing off the cusp? So actually, I'd probably do my best to finish off the cusp um, because I do have landmarks from the other cusp to know, you know, the height of it. Um, and it, it's more just so that for, for me, that's a little bit more efficient. Um, but you can do it that way as well if you feel like, oh, I, I just want to get a bit of um, support. So let's just build the cusp slightly by two millimetres make it a class two cavity, and then we can always finish the, the part on top um, without the matrix band. Yeah. Uh, personally, when I was restoring, uh, Grace, similar concept, I would probably freehand, assuming, and this is where rubber dam really helps in good isolation, freehanding your cusps to the appropriate height and then putting your sectional bands, um, for me, was the most efficient as opposed to playing around with a different brand bands and then adding sectional bands uh, later on. Um, now, and this is a common thing that I think everyone here has issues with, especially for your deep subgingival cavities, you're, you know, you're starting to sweat, the x-ray came from the previous clinician, um, you've given 30 minutes to restore uh, the deepest DO you've ever seen, <laughs> uh, how are you, how, what, what are you doing to achieve hemostasis? And, and yeah. I think, you know, let's go with the plan in mind, you know there's going to be bleeding, you know it's subgingival, what, what's your approach? Yep. Um, so I'll try my best without having to cauterize anything first. So normally um, I would just, you know, continue with uh, make sure my caries is removed um, and just be very careful in that subgingival area. But, you know, I know it's probably going to start bleeding. Um, so I'll still be quite, you know, um, aggressive with my caries removal, making sure that that's done properly. And then once I get to that area, if I need to, I can just use a diamond burr and just, um, you know, trim off the uh, the gum that may be in the way, for example. Sometimes the gum has overgrown into that cavity. Um, and then I will use a hemostat agent, for example, viscostat, to just rub it in. Um, you've got to make sure that you've actually left the viscostat or whatever you're using for a good period of time because otherwise that hemostasis won't be achieved. Um, other things that I really like to use would be a retraction cord because that pressure in itself is going to really help with achieving hemostasis. Um, and you can also use Teflon tape. Um, it's a little bit thicker and you can twist it so when you twist it, it will allow for that um, similar effect of your cord, but it's just a little bit thicker as well. Yep. And I was going to say, and this is again where you start with good local anesthetic. If you know it's going to be bleed personally, injecting into the papilla on the buccal palatal lingual, so you're getting some blanching before you get your bird to it. Um, but those are the hearts. Now, now, just to quite clarify, is your rapid dam on at that point or are you initiating that without the rubber dam and then placing rubber dam? I'm generally always putting rubber dam on first, but um, you can if you feel like, you know, you're worried about your rubber dam tearing. Um, but I think with experience, you start to sort of know as well, like the hole size, how close those holes need to be without that tearing. Um, so, yeah, I would generally have the rubber dam on. Um, and then using that pre-wedging technique can be quite useful yep. so that you're not cutting the rubber dam as you get into those areas. Yep. And the wedging is okay. going to help um, right. with hemostasis. Yeah, it'll, you know, displace your tissue and, and, and the hemostasis as well. Yeah. Um, now, now these are getting very difficult question. Tips on clamping <laughs> upright. <laughs> now, the question number one question, why, why are you restoring this tooth? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's clamp selection is going to be very important. So depends if it's a very small eight. I have used premolar clamps on eights before. Um, and then, yeah, just essentially try your clamp before you go ahead and put the whole rubber dam sheet on with the clamp. 
So I like to place it on, make sure I can rock it, make sure it has four points of contact um, because if you have only three points or two points, that that two, that it's going to slip off. So that's going back to that question about, you know, how do we stop clamps from flicking off? Um, you need four points of contact. Yeah. And, and sometimes I found before you invest in placing the rubber sheet on, just test the clamp out first. Um, yeah. when you, you have a difficult switch where you're not sure, so test it, make sure it feels, you know, uh, sturdy and you've got that four points of contact. Um, now this is again, a question that may, may come up where let's say you under rubber dam, <clears throat> you, you've, you've done your prep preparation. You're very happy. You've placed some bond. You like your, perhaps you've started your composite, perhaps you haven't. And then some sort of contamination happens. Perhaps a wedge moves, yeah. saliva gets onto it, blood gets onto it. Are you yeah. re-etching and rebonding? Um, I can I guess a little bit with air abrasion, perhaps what you're doing, but um Yeah, yes, I would be redoing that because um yeah, essentially once it's contaminated, your bond durability is going to decrease dramatically. Um, you're also probably going to get issues with sensitivity um, and, yeah, just long-term problems. So I would definitely um, re-air uh, braid, um, make sure all the bond is off as well if you need to go in with a round bird just to flick that excess bond um size 12 blade and then you know try and achieve your hemostasis with some of the tools we said pre-wedging retraction cord things like that um, and then go back into uh etch prime bond okay excellent uh, now i guess continue on rubber dam now we kind of answered this already uh have you ever found with the upper seven with the zygoma that you're not able to place a clamp or you don't, you feel like there's just not sufficient space for a clamp in that area? Um, oh, yes. Um, so sometimes what I'll actually get the patient to do is if they're, they're really wide open, that's when the zygoma can actually be an issue. Mm -hmm. So I'll actually stand up in this case and, you know, I'll use direct vision usually, and I'll get them to sort of close their mouth um, halfway. I like to say, close your mouth halfway, and then I can actually position the clamp there. Um, you can also try wingless clamps because they're a lot less bulky. Um, yeah, there's a couple of um, ways that you can get around that. But uh, I can't say that I have had a case where I haven't been able to put a clamp on. And this is where I guess your infantry is quite important to have a bit of a selection there for those unusual cases. Yeah. And I think it's, as you say, also maintaining your clamps. And, you know, once they're overused, overstretched, uh, you know, no longer functioning, considering uh, replacement. Now, this is an interesting question. You know, I'm going to interpret this question in such a way that perhaps mm -hmm. there's an open contact to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a subgingival margin, how are you closing that contact? Now, I'm going to interpret the question, perhaps there is some, there was some space to begin with, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there's been drifting due to food impaction or something of that nature. How are you closing that contact? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so... I guess there's two scenarios. If we want to completely close that contact, um, but it's, you know, originally been open, um, you might need to consider um, using a bioclear matrix. Um, I, you know, haven't really touched on that tonight, but they are very, very useful in um, creating that, that contour into proximally um, and, you may need to, you, the, the tooth beside it may also need to have um, that uh, contour as well. So you might need to use two bioclear matrices and be restoring two teeth, depending on how big that contact is. If it's a small contact, you might just be restoring that one tooth. Um, and, you know, sometimes patients do have gaps. Like I have had patients say they've got diastomas everywhere. 
um, in those cases, you just need to have the conversation with them and say, look, um, I can close the contact, but um, there'll be a bit of compromised, uh, like there'll be a bit more load bearing in this area. So sometimes that can lead to chipping or breaking, um, or we can just keep the contact open um, since that's something that you already have. Yeah. Uh, and, and those are, I think, are difficult scenarios with direct or indirect. And even with indirect, you also have that kind of un unreinforced ceramic uh, aspect as well. So something to consider. Yes. Now, a couple of questions, I guess, more to do with techniques. Have you heard of the snow or your thoughts on a snow plow technique where you're applying a little bit of flowable and then packable and light curing together? And then I'll follow up just to help move things along is with uh, genial injectable are you experiencing bubbles and how are you um, preventing that from happening mm -hmm. yeah um so in terms of the snow plow technique um i have heard that you know it helps with pushing the uh flowable sort of into the the crevices or the the corners that you want it to fill and then light curing um but personally i just want to make sure that my flowables you know completely polymerized um and that i can sort of see that it's uh elevated or it's my dentine replacement before i put packable composite over um but yes i i have heard of that technique in that um, it can be used together um, in terms of gooey, uh, yes, I do notice that it, it does have bubbles sometimes. So what I actually do is use a, a dry micro brush sometimes to just pop those bubbles. But it also does um, depend on how you're actually extruding it. So I do this kind of like motion as I'm extruding the composite and I find that helps a lot. Um, I don't know if I meant to say this, but they are actually working on a syringe tip to improve that. So, yeah, that's something to look out for. Excellent. Now, uh, another question was, instead of glycerin, is Vaseline an appropriate oxygen inhibiting layer or do you have an alternative? Um, no, so I wouldn't be using Vaseline. Um, yeah, it has to be um, glycerin. Um, with um, just thinking for it, it, it may be useful for Vaseline in those purposes when you've um, essentially uh, done, say, like an onlay prep and you've done IDS. Um, you still need to glycerin that to make sure it's fully cured. Um, but Vaseline can be put on after that um, to help with any temporaries. So you don't want to, you, often your temporaries made of bisacral. So if you're going to um, put a temporary over that, you'll sometimes find that they'll bond to each other. So Vaseline can be a good um, method to make sure that that um, comes off easily, but it's not helping the um, oxygen inhibition layer. Now, a couple last questions. And this is, again, is I think a great question by Mandy. When you're having these back-to-back -back sectionals or interproximal restorations, and, and perhaps sometimes you, you don't have anatomy in that quadrant because, you know, mm. I think similar to a case that you showed, perhaps you prepared, um, how are you determining the height or, you know, what's the best way where, where you don't have references? So, um, or, or perhaps you have a reference on the seven, but you're, you know, you're going all the way up to the four. Mm, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think when if just say if you do have the reference of one, two, like the seven, for example, um, it's very crucial then when you're doing the six to make sure your matrix placement is appropriate. You don't want your matrix sitting too high or too low because that's going to really, um, you know, make sure it, it'll mean that you're not leveling that marginal ridge and it will be a poor reference for the rest of your teeth. So I would make sure that with the one reference that I do have, like say a seven or a four, I'd make sure the one that's next to it has proper matrix placement and that I can maybe do that particular um, cavity first and then I would subsequently use that as a reference point for the rest of my cavities. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and 
Another question kind of related to clamping and sectionals was if you have a clamp tooth, let's say you placed your 13 or 12A and you're restoring that mesial and then you're finding that the sectional clamp isn't seating because perhaps the, the uh, original clamp is getting in the way. Um, how are you navigating those situations? Um, sorry, do you mind just repeating that? So, so let's imagine a scenario um, where restoring a 3.7 MO yeah. and you've placed your 13A clamp, yeah. rubber dam, and then with the sectional clamp, your, I guess the wings or the, the um, I guess the clamp clamping aspects of the sectional clamp are interfering with your rubber dam clamp. Mm -hmm. Um. I think, again, the clamp selection is really important because with my 13A clamp, it's it's very flat. Um, so often if you've pushed that clamp down enough, and sometimes I will grip the, the gums because I've got that adequate anesthesia, I need to make sure it's as apical as possible. Um, that way you know that when you put your sectional band there, it's not going to interfere. Um, whereas if you go for a more curved um, uh, clamp, that's definitely going to interfere. So one would be make sure that the clamp that you're choosing is, you know, flush and it's flat um, and also you're pushing it all the way down as much as possible. If you need to be clamping, you know, their gums, like that's what you have to do yeah um and then um i think okay i think that was the question uh last two questions i did ask you the tough ones here for a disto buckle <laughs> angulated upper seven <laughs> deep <laughs> disto buckle carries <laughs> in a patient that can't open their mouth um, <laughs> I find that access and isolation is very difficult to achieve without over prepping easily, um, cheeks pushing either clamp matrix, you know, and, and tip. And I, I think to start with James, these are the hardest mm -hmm. probably, uh, situations, probably similar to a, a lower three, seven that had caries related to impacted wisdom teeth, perhaps. Um, but, but what are your tips in navigating those? Um, so disto buckle. So I, uh, I'm guessing this is one of those situations where uh, it's not a true distal, but it's the disto buckle line angle, uh, I guess, approaching buckley and approaching true distally. And you've got the caries, perhaps was related to an impacted wisdom tooth. Um, and mm -hmm. your options are try to be conservative in your preparation. Uh, but then I guess difficult to get isolation and restore or, you know, the, the conundrum of are you opening up things and, and getting a more, I guess, occlusal top-down access. Yeah. So um, assuming in that case you don't really need a contact with um, the tooth, like say the eight's missing um, or even if the eight wasn't, was there, you'd probably look at removing that anyway at some point. Um, so... I've actually um, would recommend this technique where you you try and isolate as much as possible first with your clamp on and remove as much caries as you can. Move the clamp more and more subgingival. Again, if you need to clamp the, the gum, you just go ahead and do it. Remove all the caries. And then if your clamp is, you know, just really having a lot of trouble staying on, I would actually try and put, say, like a Toflomyel over that particular tooth. And then you can actually take the clamp off because now the Toflomyel is seated and it's actually holding that rubber dam down, almost acting a little bit like a clamp as well. So it is a tricky situation, but um, that can be uh, like you're basically taking your clamp off midway and then applying a Toflomyer, uh, restore it as much as you can, convert it to a class one cavity, and then, you know, that's where you could take it off and put the clamp back on. So it, it does require a bit of uh, experience and fiddling around, but it does work. Okay. And then last question by Richard. Any thoughts on um, a chemically set bulk fill composites like bulk EZ? plus or SDI Stella 
not sure, I haven't heard of that one yet, uh, and where no curing is required and you have this increased depth of field or depth of, sorry, uh, cure. I guess what, what um, is your experience with those and, and yeah, what, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so I guess for those more, um, you know, a deep margins, um, you want to make sure that depth of cure um, goes through. So, yes, I guess you, you can use that. I'm not too familiar, again, with the SDI Stella myself, um, so I'm not too sure on the research with that. Uh, but generally I find that with the techniques that I mentioned tonight with DME, um, you're still, you know, building everything up incrementally. Um, you're still going to have a full depth of cure. And I think if you look at the research um, with the products like a highly field flowable composite, that depth of cure usually isn't an issue so I personally sort of go with um, the the materials that I mentioned tonight yeah wonderful well Dr Raina thank you so much for everyone still tuned in uh, please check her out through her clinic um, and see what they have to offer and as um, it's been a real pleasure uh, spending the time with you for those uh, still interested I just want to let everyone know of our next event we do have our study club. Um, we do have something coming up with Dr. Rayner towards the end of the year, which we'll be announcing hopefully soon as well. But we do have an event um, focused a lot for therapists and dentists interested in pediatrics, ortho, and periodontics. So we'll be touching that in May in Melbourne. Uh, if there's anyone interested, links are in the comments below. So check them out and let us know. Um, and without further ado to everyone uh, listening tonight, thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone.